Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining podcasts. Do you like to listen? Hi, spooky people. This is Andrew Reynoso Akbarzad coming to you from California. And I'm an executive producer of the History Ghost Bump podcast. This episode is entirely listener supported. If you'd like to join me as an executive producer, check out the support the show tab at historygoesbump.com. And thanks for listening. <gasps> Did you hear that? Boo! <laughs> Scared ya. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 184th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane, and once again, I'm all by myself on this episode. Denise will be home shortly, and she'll be back with us on our next episode. On this episode, we're going to feature the Delta Bespero Hotel, which was suggested to us by Corianne Wilson. This is a railway hotel that is up in Saskatchewan, Canada, in the town of Saskatoon. And the neat thing about these railway hotels, when you think of having a hotel near a railroad and a railroad station, many of us think, oh, it's probably one of those cheap places like a Motel 6 or maybe even one of those places that you can rent by the hour, maybe a little local hotel, not part of a chain Well, these railway hotels were magnificent and beautiful, and the Delta Bespero is definitely gorgeous. It also happens to be haunted, so we'll be sharing the history and hauntings of this location in just a moment. Also in this episode, we'll have the 12th installment in the third series of Tim Prassel's Spectral Edition. We want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Rollin with two L's, Susan, Carly, Rich, Lori, and Christine. And now, this moment in oddity. This moment in oddity was suggested to us by Lisa Lauren Schmidt. Jean Hilliard was 19 years old and living in Langby, Minnesota, when something incredible happened to her. She was driving to meet up with her neighbor when her car skidded off the ice-covered road. It was the coldest it had been for some time with temperatures of 25 degrees below zero. And Jean Hilliard was literally frozen solid as she walked for help. Her neighbor discovered her and rushed her to the hospital. Her arms were so frozen they were unmovable. Ice clung to her in places and the nurses claimed that touching her skin was like touching ice in a freezer. Her face was white and had the look of death and there was not much hope that she would be revived. Besides frostbite, another hazard of being frozen is that water expands when it is frozen. It was believed that there was damage on a microscopic level, including severe brain damage. Jean awoke from her coma with no major effects of having been frozen solid like a block of ice. She was released from the hospital after a month. This is considered an unexplained medical miracle, and that certainly is odd. Welcome. We have been expecting you. (laughs) And now, this month in history. In the month of February, on the 3rd, in 1889, the outlaw Bell Star was killed in Oklahoma with two shotgun blasts to the back. Star was known as the Bandit Queen. 
She started out with a relatively normal life, being born into a middle-class family on a farm in Carthage, Missouri. The Civil War changed all that when her father's innkeeping business was ruined and her brother Edwin lost his life in the war. The family moved to Texas and Belle met a string of bad men. She married one of them named Jim Reed and became his partner in crime, wrestling cattle and stealing money. This lasted for five years and then Reed was killed in 1874 by a member of his own gang. Bell took off for the Oklahoma Indian Territory and met a Cherokee outlaw named Sam Starr, who became her common-law husband. The two continued their criminal ways and were arrested in 1883, both serving five months for horse theft. In 1886, Sam Starr was killed in a gunfight and Bell was alone again. She then met her final partner in crime and love, a Creek named Jim July. He was later arrested and sent to Fort Smith for punishment for his crimes. Bell accompanied him part of the way and then decided to return home. She was ambushed on the way and fatally shot in the back by two shotgun blasts. The murderer was never found and the case remains unsolved. The Castle Lake Delta Bespero Hotel is a four-star, ten-story hotel located in downtown Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Today it is owned by Marriott, but this historic hotel dates back to 1928 when it was built by the Canadian National Railway. Railway hotels were built all across Canada, with many of them sharing the same architecture. Many locals refer to the Bespero as the Bess and many of them have tales of hauntings that take place in the hotel. There seem to be several spirits hanging around the best in the afterlife. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the Delta Bestboro Hotel. Saskatoon is considered Saskatchewan's great crossroads, and isn't it fun to say those together, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan? <laughs> Can you say it ten times fast? I'm not even going to try. The Cree tribe lived here, and the name Saskatoon is derived from the Cree word for the berry that is native to the region, Missasquatomina. A group of Toronto Methodists formed the Temperance Colonization Society, and they believed the Saskatoon area would be a great place to set up a dry community. Apparently, in Toronto and Ontario, a lot of liquor was being served, and they didn't like that. There was a huge liquor business going on there, and they wanted to move out basically to the middle of nowhere so they could get away from it. They relocated here in 1882, led by John Nielsen Lake. The railway was not completed to Saskatoon, so they took it to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and then they had to ride on these horse-drawn carts the rest of the way, and it was not an easy trip. There were 3,100 settlers. Lake is considered the founder of Saskatoon for this reason, since he led all the people there. The Temperance Society folded within 10 years. Not many new settlers wanted to come to the area, and internal fighting led to the demise. The railway finally arrived in 1901, and another settlement set up on the west side of the South Saskatchewan River, near the railway station. This settlement would incorporate and keep the name Saskatoon, and the original village was changed to Nutana. A third settlement named Riverdale formed on the west side of the railroad tracks. These three settlements decided to become one city, and they all eventually became Saskatoon in 1906. The city grew rapidly, and by 1911, the population had more than doubled. A lot of agriculture was going on in this area. Canadian Pacific Railway was founded in 1881 with the purpose of connecting interior towns to each other and to the coast. A railway had already been under construction, but it was way behind schedule and running out of money. So this group of Scottish-Canadian businessmen formed the Canadian Pacific Railway Company to fix the issues with money and running behind. And the construction took off after about a year. They had a lot of rain, and so the delays continued. But once the rain stopped, they were able to really get the railroad going. By 1885, the last spike in the Transcontinental Railway was driven into the ground. With the railway came a need for lodgings, and this became the advent of railway hotels in Canada. The first one was built in Montreal in 1878 and named the Windsor Hotel. The Canadian Pacific Railway opened its first hotel in 1888 in Vancouver. The hotels were meant to be luxurious and were mainly built in a chateau style of architecture. It is a style considered distinctly Canadian with turrets and Scottish baronial elements. 
Several smaller railways were struggling, and the government incorporated them together into the Canadian National Railway. So you have the Canadian Pacific Railway, and now you have the Canadian National Railway. This happened in 1919. Some of you may have heard of the Grand Trunk Railway, and I think we had a story that was one of our history stories about a train going off of the bridge into the water and a bunch of people being killed, and I believe it was the Grand Trunk Railway because I'd like the name. This was another railway that ended up rolling into the Canadian National Railway. So basically what you have are these two big railroad companies now. This rival company to the Canadian Pacific Railway also built railway hotels, which was something the Grand Trunk Railway had already been doing before it was amalgamated into the National Railway. And it's called the National Railway because the government took it over. So you've got one that's still private, and then you've got one that is by the government. The Saskatoon business community lobbied the Canadian National Railway to build a railway hotel in Saskatoon. At the time, Sir Henry Thornton was president of the Canadian National Railway. So he announced on December 31st, 1928, that they would go ahead and build a hotel in Saskatoon. It was going to be designed by Archibald and Schofield of Montreal. John Archibald was a Scottish immigrant, and John Schofield was an immigrant from Ireland. Both had the same names, but had some different kinds of design ideas but both from the European continent. So they brought with them this idea of a Bavarian castle. And so the hotel is designed to resemble a Bavarian castle. They began construction in the month of February. And uh, as I remember from living in Colorado, starting construction in the middle of winter is not a great idea, especially the further north you go. So you're thinking Canada in February and they're going to start digging into the ground. We all know that they had a hard time digging graves and would keep people kind of cold until they could bury them in the spring thaw. So they had to bring in a steam thaw and a gasoline excavator so that they could dig up the ground to begin construction. The hotel was built from Tyndall stone, tile, and bricks, all of which were made in Canada. The hotel was completed in 1932 with 225 rooms and two restaurants. Now, while construction was being done, this big, horrible thing was sweeping across the world. You probably all can guess what that would be in the 1930s, the Great Depression. So travel was hit hard because if you don't have enough money to even pay your bills, you're probably not going to be traveling anywhere and certainly not staying in these really nice, luxurious hotels. So the hotel was ready to go in 1932, but nobody was coming to stay. So it didn't officially open until December 10th, 1935. So it sat there for about three years without anybody coming to stay. Then it had its first guest on that day. So that's why it was officially opened. And that guest's name was Horace N. Stoven. Probably the only thing he's quote unquote famous for. (laughs) The hotel was named Bestboro after Sir Vere Ponsonby. And his first name is V-E-R-E. So I'm not exactly sure how that would be said. He was the ninth Earl of Bestboro. And at this time, he was the 14th Governor General of Canada. He and the Countess visited the hotel while it was being built. In 1972, the best traded hands and was bought by Donald Dick and Mark Baltson. Ten years later, the Canadian Pacific Hotels purchased Canadian National Hotels, and the best was placed under CP Hotels subsidiary Delta Hotels during the 1990s, which is where the Delta part of its name comes from. Fairmont Hotels and Resorts then came in and bought the CP Hotels and the Delta Hotels in 1999. So they pretty much owned everything that was considered a railway hotel. And that year, a $9 million renovation was begun on the hotel, and it was restored to much of its original historic elegance. There was another renovation in 2003. Today, the best is owned by Marriott and features several meeting and conference rooms and is surrounded by five acres of Elizabethan gardens just a gorgeous hotel. I can imagine that it's pretty gorgeous inside. A lot of the interior pictures that I've seen of the rooms and the lobby, it's very modern in its decor. So I think the elements of the architecture and interior are still historic, but the decor is has not been kept that way from what I've seen from pictures. More than just guests stay at the best. It is reputedly quite haunted and has at least three paranormal hotspots, 
But as I kept searching through, it looks like there might be more than just these three spots and these apparitions seem to move around. Some of them are confused with each other, but it looks like we have a handful of ghosts at this particular hotel. The Adam Ballroom is 4,024 square feet. So this is a large ballroom and it's a favorite venue for weddings and receptions. It's located on the convention floor level. There is another ballroom at the hotel, which is on a different level, but this seems to be the larger one. This also happens to be the one that is reputedly haunted by an apparition that is wearing a gray suit and fedora. He appears full-bodied and has even said hello to passers-by, so he seems to be a friendly guy, even though he's a hat man. (laughs) I'm sure many of you have heard of the hat man ghost, so when I hear of a ghost wearing a fedora, it's like, uh, maybe that's not so good but he appears to be friendly. Guests will mention to employees that they saw a man wearing a dated suit just hanging around without any purpose. Employees are unable to find the man and now generally explain to these guests that they may have seen a ghost. Now, I don't know how many of them are actually telling guests, oh, maybe you saw a ghost. So they might just kind of be keeping that among themselves. He's thought to be a former employee of the hotel, I would say he would be more likely a manager just based on the fact that he's wearing a suit if he's an employee and the action that he took that led to his death. There were these two guys that were drunk in the hotel causing a ruckus. You know how that goes. So, of course, the manager gets called. Go talk to these guys. He asked the men to quiet down or leave the hotel. And their response was to pick him up and hurl him over the balcony. And the Adam Ballroom is up on the top floor, I believe from the schematics that I've seen, the floor plan. So he fell at least seven stories, possibly nine. And reputedly, there is still a crack on the floor where he hit. And I'm thinking it probably would have been right there in the lobby. So that would have been pretty horrific. One man who claims to have seen this ghost was the co-founder of Paranormal Saskatchewan, Colin Tranborg. He also was told by a witness that they saw this man looking at them through the window of a storage room, which would be impossible because, as Colin put it, there's no way he could have been out there because he would have fallen to his death. So apparently he doesn't just have to hang out near the ballroom or on the convention floor. He seems to be able to float outside of the hotel because I'm thinking this storage room has a window that faces outside or it has to be wherever there's not a place to stand outside this window. There are those that claim the man in the gray suit is someone different than the man wearing the gray fedora. So there's some that say there's a ghost wearing a gray suit and then there's a ghost wearing a gray fedora. So I don't know if this is a story that's gotten mixed together or if there are literally two different ones. As you know, when it comes to these legends and they get passed along, they could have gotten split up or put together. Some guests and staff say they've seen a figure moving through the terrace lounge that is now a banquet room. Hotel guests used to congregate in this lounge. They would send letters, read the newspaper, visit with each other. So it seems that this man who's in the fedora is hanging out in this room, wandering around, possibly looking for his friends. Now, it doesn't say, do both of these spirits say hello to people and acknowledge them? To me, that would make you the same one, because to find two friendly ghosts, both wearing the same colors, basically, and saying hi to people, more than likely the same apparition, not different. The third floor is the next haunted hotspot. The apparition that is seen here is said to be terrifying. The spirit resembles a very small woman whom looks tired and depressed. Her hair and clothing is a mess. So you're thinking, well, how is that terrifying? Well, as long as people ignore the spirit, she keeps to herself, so there's nothing to worry about. But if someone acknowledges her, she runs up to the person and screams in their face, and then she suddenly disappears. So yeah, That would be a little terrifying even if she wasn't a ghost to have somebody come up and scream in your face. The stairwell is said to be haunted. This haunting features the spirits of several children. People claim that it sounds like they're playing in the stairwell. They ignore the guests, so this could just be a residual haunting. It is believed that they were killed at the hotel somehow, but there is no story to go with this. Colin the head of the Saskatchewan Paranormal Group, said he had been told that children have been seen roaming and playing in the corridors as well. 
There's also a story about a bellman haunting a stairwell. According to Stefan Dupriez, the sales and marketing director for the Delta Bespero. Dupriez shared a story he was told by an employee. Someone took a picture of him coming down one of the stairs. When they developed the picture, there was this apparition in behind him, and he swears to this day it was a ghost. Apparently, the bellman was running with luggage down the stairwell, and he tripped and tumbled to his death. There is a section of broken marble on one of the staircases that people claim is where he fell. The apparition appears on this very spot. So now we have two places with broken tile, marble, flooring, something of that nature. I haven't been in the hotel, so I don't know if these are two separate locations. But just interesting to have this many spirits hanging out. Many people have come through the Bess, obviously, in her decades of service, a lot of them traveling, so they probably were coming through fairly quickly. Is it possible that some of those guests and some of the employees have continued to stay on in the afterlife? Is the Delta Bessboro Hotel haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, I don't know. It looks like a beautiful place. I've been to Regina, Saskatchewan, never been to Saskatoon. So it'd be really cool to see these hotels in person for sure. On our next episode, we're going to be joined by the hosts of the Hillbilly Horror Stories podcast, Jerry Polly and his wife. We're going to be talking about a location from their home state, which is Kentucky. It's one that I'm sure most of you have probably heard of before. It is reputedly very haunted, and that is Bobby Mackey's Music World. So we will be talking about that on our next episode. And now we have the 12th installment in the third series of Tim Prassel's Spectral Edition. And this is entitled Ghostly Critters. Welcome to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prassel. I'm happy to report that sometimes ghost hunters, if they don't get their ghost, at least they get an adequate solution to the mystery that they're investigating. This is illustrated by a ghost report that was published in the Barber County Index of Medicine Lodge, Kansas. It appeared on July 22nd of 1908, and I'm going to skip over the headline. New York. For several weeks, persons living on the outskirts of Jacksonville, New Jersey, have taken a wide detour after nightfall to avoid passing an empty house on the abandoned farm formerly occupied by Joseph Holloway. The house had the reputation of being haunted. At night, those who ventured near the building heard strains of weird music emanating from the interior, and other strange sounds aided in creating the impression that ghosts tenanted the dismal-looking structure. Bolder spirits of the village finally decided that they would solve the mystery of the haunted house. Jacob Grother, Charles Spangler, and Michael Dormus formed a committee of investigation. The trio approached the haunted house around nine o'clock, As they neared the building, their ears were greeted by the uncanny music that had alarmed the timid wayfarers. Grother wanted to turn back, but his courage was bolstered up by the determined demeanor of his companions, who declared that they would solve the mystery no matter what occurred. One of the men carried a lantern. He led the way in through the open door. The strange music led them into what was formerly the kitchen. A strange form loomed up before them, and a hollow rattle of the board floor marked the sudden termination of the music. Under the glare of the light, the mystery was solved. The ghost was an old mule, belonging to Abraham Wallen, a farmer. As the men gazed on the startled mule, the music started again, and the investigators learned how it originated. The hairless tail of the mule beat rapidly over wires that the former occupants of the house had left on the kitchen window. Every time the mule switched his tail, the wires gave forth a sound like someone strumming on a harp. Now Jacksonville breathes easier. And the headline of this article is, Ghost Was Only a Mule. Mystery that puzzled Jacksonville, New Jersey is solved by citizens. Now, that ghost report, I could imagine that that actually happened and people started spreading this story because it's pretty funny. Eventually, it got to a reporter's ear and it went into the newspaper. This next ghost report, which is very short and fairly similar, strikes me as more of a tall tale. A story that might have actually happened, but then it was exaggerated and maybe exaggerated. Let me read it to you. This appeared in the Butler Weekly Times from Missouri 
and was printed on July 20th of 1916. Hearing his piano playing in the night and not being able to see who was playing it, a Neosho man concluded his house was haunted. He watched for a few nights and finally caught a musically inclined possum running up and down the keyboard. The possum was captured and placed in a local zoo. Two things catch my attention here. He thought his house was haunted because he heard somebody playing the piano or something playing the piano. That seems like a bit of a stretch. And I've lived on either side of Missouri, in Illinois and in Oklahoma. There are a lot of possums here. We really don't put them in the zoo. So, as I say, I think maybe this one was exaggerated. I'm Tim Prossel, and you've been listening to Spectral Edition. I have almost 300 of these articles. I post one each Wednesday on my website. I've also got a lot of other things happening on that website. It's called The Merry Ghost Hunter. Mary is spelled M-E-R-R-Y. I hope you stop by sometime. Thanks, Tim. We'd love to have you check out our website at historyghostbump.com. That's where you can find us on social media. If you would like to send us some feedback, you can do that via email at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We did receive an email from Dawn. She said, I was just listening to your show about the haunted universities in Texas. I went to Cedar Crest College in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and we have more or less the exact same story about a ghost called Wanda. This makes me think of that movie, A Fish Called Wanda. (laughs) Supposedly, she was a student in the 1950s who committed suicide when she found out she was pregnant. She is said to have hanged herself in a stairwell in Butts Hall. Students have seen her falling over the railing, and she sometimes plays pranks in that hall, like hiding students' supplies right before class. Just thought it was odd enough to mention really been enjoying your podcast. It makes my super boring workday pass much more quickly. Well, you're welcome for us helping you get through that workday, Dawn. And how interesting to have a very similar ghost story about a pregnant girl in the 1950s who committed suicide at a college campus. Then we got a couple of messages over on the fan page. This one's from Joseph. Just got done listening to Point Lookout. Great episode. I've gotten the opportunity to walk around the lighthouse, and next to it there's a restored Fort Lincoln with all the buildings and earthworks. Our Civil War unit stayed there a few times, and it is very creepy. My friend and I were sleeping in one of the bunks in the main barracks, and he observed a soldier come out of what was a storage closet, open the wood burner, and stoke the fire, and return to the storage closet, and that was the last we saw of him. So I'm assuming, he says, they're Civil War unit, so reenactors maybe staying there? Very, very interesting. So was this a third soldier hanging out? You know, we said there's probably more than just one or two when you had that many men who were imprisoned. And then Lori sent us this very fun story. Hello, I just discovered your podcast and still catching up to the current episode. I love the way you mix history and hauntings. I wanted to share a funny story. My husband and I visited one of the cemeteries in New Orleans a few years ago. It was in the Garden District. Sorry, I can't remember the name right now. It was Christmas Eve around 1.30 p.m. We were asked if we wanted a paid tour, but we declined. We wandered around, and at about 2.30 p.m., we walked to the exit gate. As you probably know, the cemeteries are surrounded by big, large iron fences with spikes. We went to leave, and the front gate was chained and locked, with us still inside. Nobody was in sight. After a quick panic moment, my husband ran around the whole place looking for a way out. He actually crawled onto a few of the tombs to see if he could get over the fence. He finally found an old work shed that had a small wall and a small section of the fence that did not have the spikes. I just had hip surgery a few months before. I was doing well but had a limited range of motion. He had to crawl on the wall and squat so I could stand on his knees and get over. Just as he got over after me, one of the residents walked out and said, They don't usually let you guys out until Halloween. I love it. We laugh about it often as it is one of the odd things that has happened to us. I always tell them I'm glad I married an Eagle Scout so I didn't have to be embarrassed calling 911 to report being locked inside a cemetery. Keep up the great work and I'm excited to listen to you girls to catch up on the podcast. That is hilarious, Lori. I can only imagine the panic of being locked into a cemetery. I was like, how in the world did they not walk around and make sure that it was empty? (laughs) Well, at least you guys didn't get arrested for breaking and entering or anything like that, them thinking that you were sneaking out. And I love the comment of the resident going by. You should have like done a weird little, since you'd had hip surgery, you could have just like kind of dragged yourself along and limped and maybe they would have thought you were a zombie. 
We have a review from over on iTunes. This is from Third Shift Tim, and this is actually an updated review. Updating it to five stars keeps getting better. I wrote a review on July 14th, 2016. After rereading what I wrote, it was an honest review, but it does not reflect my current opinion of the HGB podcast. Denise and Diane have become a very polished duo. They aren't just the hosts of a podcast. They are family now. To hear their familiar voices and the camaraderie with each other, priceless. Glad that this week, day, month, whatever we're doing in history was kept. When they first said it was going away, my first reaction was goodbye, girls, but it stayed and so did I. Well, I'm glad we kept it then so we could keep you, Tim. And we enjoy doing it. And I think that doing the month is working out perfectly. We want to thank you all for listening to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to welcome new executive producers, Richard Zeliff, Melanie, and Cerise Locke. And thank you to Kevin Sunberg and Mary S. Dobrik for your one-time donations. Thanks. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting, and join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us. <laughs>